ladies and gentlemen, the person I'm talking to, to some needs no introduction, but however, if you live uh, somewhere in the world, perhaps he does. San Francisco Public Defender Defa Dachi, how are you? Hey, good. Thanks for having me, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Dachi presides over an office that has 90 attorneys, a budget of approximately $24 million, and you've been in office since 2002. Yeah, and we provide representation for about 25,000 people wow. a year in San Francisco. And you, I want to congratulate you because I get your press releases and you really do help those in need. But the biggest issue I want to talk about, and this is as my, my constant viewers know is your platform, but the San Francisco surveillance scandal, police surveillance scandal. Can you talk to my viewers about that who have no idea what this is about? Well, as you know, Zenny, this is the age of uh, technology and right. video, and as they say, everyone has an eye on you. And one thing that we've seen, particularly in criminal law, is surveillance videos playing a more important role. You can remember in San Francisco we had a controversy as to whether or not the, the police should be right. posting uh, surveillance videos. Well, what happened is a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a case where the client said the police came into my uh, room uh, without a warrant, and if you had read the police report uh, that the police wrote under penalty of perjury, they said, well, no, we got consent and we followed the book and we did everything we needed to do to get into the room. Well, guess what? There was a video right in the hallway, and if you look at the video, it directly contradicts what the police say. Now, police have to have a warrant in order to go into your home. That's, this is America. This is the Constitution. And these officers uh, were uh, flagrantly violating uh, the Constitution. In one of the videos, you can even see one of the police officers who knows the surveillance cameras there put his hand over the surveillance camera. And he knew he was being watched. That. He knew the camera was there. He put his hand over it, but then he pulled it back, and then you can see the officers going into the room. So he didn't keep his hand up there long enough. But the bottom line here is that the conduct that was captured on the videotape was illegal, and it contradicted what the officers put in a police report. Now, when they, a police officer writes a police report, there's a little thing that says, under penalty of perjury, meaning that you swear that what you write is true. And so if you read the police report, and you compare it to what was in the videotape, they didn't match. Then we got another videotape that uh, showed a man walking into an apartment and uh, the police make an arrest there. The police officers find a white jacket, a bright white jacket uh, with drugs on it. And they say, there's other people in the room, they say, that white jacket belongs to you, a, a young African-American man. And the police say, we saw you wearing the jacket, we had the hotel under surveillance, that's your drugs. He gets jailed for three weeks. Just like that. He's jail. He's in jail for three weeks, charged with crimes. He can go to prison for five or six years. Go back and look at the video. What does it show? Guy wearing a black jacket. And he had told the police. Oh, my God. That wasn't my jacket. I wasn't wearing that white jacket. That's my jacket. They not only did not include that in the police report, but if you read the police report again, they say clearly they saw him wearing a white jacket. What do I think happened in that instance? I doubt very much that they saw anybody going into that hotel. They just simply saw the guy in the room and said, that's your jacket. I mean, think about it. How are they going to know that that guy who's walking into a hotel is going to walk into a room that they're going to bust that evening? And again, what we're concerned about here is the violation of constitutional rights. Now, some people might say, well, you know, so what if constitutional rights are violated? Mm -hmm. Well, again, if we can't trust a police officer to tell the truth about, you know, what kind of jacket you were wearing, or how they got into a room, or whether they used master keys in order to get into a room illegally. We can't trust that. We can't trust anything. And we can't have a criminal justice system that's predicated on perjury and lies. But if this happened now, it begs the question, how often does it happen? In the past, we have had reports of officers going into the room without a warrant, and it comes down to the police officer's word against a person that's accused of a crime. Well, guess who wins most of the time? And often the judge will believe the police officer over an accused. What's different about this time, this time, is that we have a video. And when you have a video, hey, 
You can't deny it. Is that to say, God, tons of questions now. Is that to say that appellate courts look the other way on police actions like they have in the past? You know, is when it, it safe comes, to ask that question? Is when that, it comes to police misconduct, um, you know, it, it's a, a very sad to say that the system doesn't take it seriously. That even in this case, take the case, you know, where the video contradicted what the police officers said, the officers testified in court consistent with what they wrote in the police report, which the video disproved. The video was shown in court, right? The judge dismissed the case because obviously the officer had lied and had committed perjury, which is a felony, okay? What happened to the officer? Nothing. The district attorney, the prosecutor... Not even a reprimand. Yeah, the prosecutor in the case continued to argue uh, that the search was legal, and it wasn't until we published the videos uh, that we got the response that we did. And some people say, well, you know, why would you uh, publish this to the media? For two reasons. People have a right to know. They do have a right to know. You know, the police are public servants, and if they're out there, you know, going into apartments without a, a warrant uh, and lying about it later, that's something that you that's ought to know. That's taxpayer dollars. Yeah. And the second thing uh, is that nothing happens unless the public knows about this, you don't have the reaction. This attorney's office has dismissed 57 cases, and rightly so. Why? Because you cannot trust perjured testimony. Are there going to be more cases possibly down the line because of this that you have to look at back? And I understand there's an investigation that's going to be conducted by the foreign police chief. Um, what do you think about that? Well, there's some breaking news. Ah. It turns out that... I get a scoop. Uh, Thanks. That, 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 that former uh, chief... Uh, George Gascon, who's now our district attorney, who's now our mm -hmm. district attorney, police chief to district attorney, has announced uh, that he's not doing an independent investigation wow. and instead is handing the whole case over to the FBI and the U.S. attorneys. So the feds are coming in uh, to do the investigation, and I agree with that. I, I think that is a good uh, way to go on this. Uh, my only concern is that they keep us informed because we need to know what's happening with this uh, with this investigation. Also, we have to go through as many, I think at least one to 2,000 cases at a minimum that we have to review. It doesn't mean all those cases are gonna be dismissed, but we have to review them because these officers were involved in other cases. You see, once a police officer commits perjury in a case or lies about something in a case, that becomes admissible in other cases. So, you know, this is a Pandora's box and uh, it's already been opened. How much of this is like, because it's beginning to sound from one perspective like the writer's case. Is it possible if you take it to one logical possible scenario, the entire San Francisco Police Department could wind up under some sort of consent decree? You know, that's a brilliant question. No one's asked me that <laughs> question yet. You know, I don't want to give people the impression that all police officers are involved in this kind of conduct. I know a lot of the officers work with them and um, you know, from what I can see, these are just groups of, of police officers. But I do think it's part of the culture. I do think it's endemic. Um, and my concern is what is going to prevent this from happening in the future? Unless we have checks and balances, unless we have, say, a requirement that a judge report uh, an illegal uh, entry into an apartment or a prosecutor report that information and that there be some consequences to it. And we do have an oversight uh, function within the police department, it's obviously not working. So who is going to protect the public against this kind of behavior? Now, you might say, well, you know, so what if this happens in the Tenderloin? So what if they take a master key and go into somebody's room? Oh, it's justified. Well, you know, you, you might feel that way until it's your house. Right. And that's actually begs another question. Have, it seems all of these cases happen in poor neighborhoods. Yeah. Not, not necessarily poor minority because Tenderloin yeah. has a good mix. Yeah. But still, poor. Yeah. Well, you know, these are neighborhoods that have, you know, issues with crime, no question about that. And one thing it's important to distinguish, though, is that the, you know, the ends do not justify the means. That we have one constitution, whether you live in Pacific Heights mm -hmm. or whether you're living in the Tenderloin. And you can't assume that because you live in the Tenderloin, you're giving up your right to privacy, and that a police officer can come into your house any time using a master key. That's wrong. So I wrote a letter to the uh, acting police chief and the DA saying, we've got to change this. Let's have a policy banning that kind of uh, 
activity. What was their response? I haven't heard anything yet. Really? Yeah. You would think that the police chief, I would think that the police chief, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, mm. would be on this lickety split from a PR standpoint saying, Let, let's, let's put this fire out. But that's not happening. Right. I mean, does I that think, justify their? Does that are they justifying their own actions? I think that when something like this happens, uh, the first re reaction is, uh, oh, you know, it's not a big deal, or oh, you know, it just involves a, a couple of police officers. We're far beyond that now. Uh, the focus really has to be uh, making sure that we ferret out uh, all the acts of misconduct. I've received letters and phone calls uh, from people. I got a letter uh, the other day from a gentleman uh, who reported that he lives next door to a uh, SRO hotel and that the police uh, went to his apartment. Uh, he lives there with his girlfriend. He'd never been in trouble before and they went into his apartment and started searching around and they ran a warrant check on him without any reason. And you know, he didn't think about it at the time. He was upset, but he didn't think about reporting it to anybody. So he read about this in the newspaper and he wrote me a letter so I'm going to write him back uh, but you know we're learning more and more we had another incident where a landlord at the Lutz hotel mm -hmm. this is a, the owner of the hotel there's a 22 unit hotel motel and uh, he reported that the police came uh, into his office and pushed him by the shoulder and demanded a master key and so I talked to him on the phone and he was terrified by what had happened. And I said, well, had this ever happened before? He said, no. He said, they've come to the hotel and asked for the master key. He said that it happened six times before. And they went upstairs and they went into people's rooms. And he expressed consent. He goes, you know what? I believe in the police. I want to help them. You know, I'm against crime, but you can't use me just to go into people's apartments yeah. without any reason. And so, you know, he expressed this and you know, here it is. I mean, we're in America, and it's 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 frightening to think that that could happen. And, and he was actually assaulted uh, by a police officer, and he had written a letter uh, to uh, the captain uh, in his district and received no response at all. And so when I found out about it, I called him, and uh, I included him uh, his story in 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 a request to, to change this master key. Well, I mean, no one should have the power to get a master key no, not at and, all. And, and, and to go through apartments. I mean, heck, if that was happening, uh, you know, at at, uh, at at the Hilton Hotel or, mm -hmm. you know, at uh, at one of these nice condominiums oh, the w. Uh, here in the city, or right. yeah, yeah, I mean, people would be outraged. Yeah, Think, imagine it happening at the Game Developer Conference. The conference would leave, yeah. right? Right. What do we have to do? Do we have to give, I don't know, mounted cameras to people in certain neighborhoods to, so they can protect themselves? I mean, what do we have to do to make sure that, that what appears to be appears to be allegedly an endemic process yeah, yeah. stops? Yeah, I mean, it's... it's within mounted police, cameras are available, by the way. Yeah. I'm not wearing one. <laughs> within the police department, uh, I think they have to change the culture. That's number one, because it can't just be, well, um, you know, if you're watching me, I'll be good or I'll follow the Constitution. It really has to come from here. Because remember that most of the encounters that people have with police, we never hear about or we never right, see right. on video. So That's why I was mentioning the pin mounted camera. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And, you know, in, in, in some I'm, police I'm giving them an idea. Yeah, <laughs> some police departments do use that. <laughs> but I think on a, you know, on a big picture level, uh, we really have to look at what are the consequences when this occurs. You know, uh, uh, if you lie on the witness stand, there are consequences. It's called perjury. It's a crime. Mm -hmm. But is it different for police? Are we going to excuse perjury by police because it's convenient to do so? And that's really the question that, you know, that this, this whole incident has, has raised uh, in, in, in the public's eye. I'm curious because I've also talked to a number of people who were with the Oakland Gang Prevention Task Force, cop police. And uh, another friend told me something I'll never forget. He said, you have to have a certain number of bad apples in order to well, theoretically match the bad apples that are out there. At what point do we allow or continue to allow an exception for bad apple behavior in order to 
you ultimately catch a criminal. I mean, have we gone too far one way? Well, it's like that movie Training Day by yeah, David Washington. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you watch that movie for a while. Great and, example. And, and that was based on the Rampart scandal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell the difference between the gangster, you know, and, 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 and the police officer. Oh, could and, you tell my viewers what the Rampart scandal was? In, for, for well, the Rampart yeah. scandal uh, involved uh, a unit uh, in Los Angeles that was not only involved in drugs and conspiracies, they were actually involved in, in murder. And so, you know, when this scandal broke in Los Angeles, a lot of people were wrongfully convicted um, of crimes. Uh, drugs were planted on people, firearms were planted on people, and uh, it, it car- caused, uh, 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 you know, took the criminal justice system and turned it on its head. And, and, and so, when we hear about these incidents, you know, in Contra Costa County, I mean, you know, right, a lot right. of people don't, right. don't read the, the newspapers and may not know about this, but th- there was the a head of the narcotics squad Right, there talk about that one. I'm glad you brought who, that up. Who was right. selling uh, mm-hmm. methamphetamine. But not only that, but they actually had, I guess it's a scam, where he was working with a private investigator right. to mm-hmm. have uh, people who were involved in child custody and divorce proceedings arrested for crimes in order to sully their records. Now think about that. I mean, that's... That's, that's, that's insane that that's happening. You know, the whole of this, it has to give a reasonable, per, a reasonable person pause, doesn't it? In other words, to say, what has happened to our law enforcement system? Can, can we trust it? Well, again, you know, I, I want to individualize it because mm-hmm. there are a lot of police officers who do their jobs and, and have a hard job, no question about that. But we can't have a police officer, a group of police officers, a rogue police officer, or a rogue unit uh, out there uh, systematically and nonchalantly violating people's rights. Because when that happens, no one is safe. If you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong police officer, you can end up in prison. Uh, just like uh, the man I told you about earlier, uh, who, uh, but for the grace of God uh, and a video camera, would, be in, would right. be in prison today because the cop said, you're wearing this jacket that we found drugs in. And the videotape, of course, told a different story. How long is the investigation going to take now the FBI is involved, do you think? You know, uh, I haven't been contacted uh, by the FBI, and uh, certainly I hope I, I, I will be about this. Yeah. And I Hold think on a second. Call this man, will you? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I think that... Uh, there are going to be more incidents that we're going to hear about over the next, uh, you know, few months, a uh, few because this is not something that that just started in December. This happened to be two events that were not for uh, an investigator in my office and uh, a public defender who decided to investigate their client's claim, obtain the video, learn that the video exists, and then. You know, with that, other people find out about it. Were it not for that, uh, much of this would not have come out. Again, for many years, uh, you know, we've argued in the courts uh, about uh, this activity going on, um, but it was only uh, once the video was presented that the claims were, 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 were believed. This is going to be up by well, tomorrow, Saturday. Yeah. Is there a number that someone should call if they have something to report or? Yes. If you do have an incident uh, to re- report, please call uh, 575-4390, 415-575-4390. And we're looking for incidents uh, involving illegal entries. If you've been the victim of an illegal entry uh, here in San Francisco, if you have uh, you know, an incident to report involving uh, police misconduct, uh, it's something that we'd like to know about and be able to investigate. So that's one of the reasons why we've reached out to the public because people need to know this and people need to uh, have a way of reporting uh, misconduct when it occurs. Just to give people a, a full picture of you in the office, what are the cases that you handle that you want the public to know about? Or Because um, I know that you've gotten, there have been a number of great acquittals, so like, um, but you handle everything from, I think, someone was acquitted for, well, give us a picture of the kind of cases you take on. Well, we handle, again, 25,000 cases a year, which it's seems a like a, a huge number of cases yeah. for 
you know, a staff of 90 attorneys and about 80 support staff, and it is. I've been with the office for 22 years, and we handle very uh, uh, heavy case loads. And uh, let me tell you, every attorney in mine, we don't, we don't, we're not paid overtime. I works an average of uh, 50 to 60, sometimes 70 hours a week if you're in trial. And uh, a great part of this job, though, is that you never know what you're going to be dealing with uh, when you walk in the door every morning because uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we have programs like our Clean Slate program where we help clear people's records uh, after they've rehabilitated themselves. Uh, we have programs that help people, you know, get their life back on track mm -hmm. because, see, the one thing that you, you don't want at the end of the day is for the person to come back. You know, if they've been in trouble, if they've, you know, had uh, trouble with the law, you want to give them the tools to succeed. And that's really a part of what we try to do that's unique about this Public Defender's Office. Above and beyond that, our day-to-day -day work is what we do in court, you know, advocating uh, for clients. Because remember, when you are charged with a crime, when you are charged with a crime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not you, but... No, that's right. <laughs> hey, I got, I got DUI. I can, yeah. I'll admit that. I know. I'm, I'm open about that because, you know, I made a mistake. You know, we all make mistakes. Paris Hilton made a mistake. So that's, you know. So. But see, most people don't think about uh, the criminal justice system, you know, until they're in a situation mm -hmm. where a family member is charged with a crime. And then you see that the entire weight of the state and the resources are against you. Yeah. And if they're against you, um, you have to have a voice in that. And people will say, well, you know, how can you represent somebody who's guilty? Or how can you represent somebody who's charged with a heinous crime? Well, if you think about it, all right, just because you read something in the newspaper doesn't mean it's true. Right, absolutely. Right? We have to investigate these cases. We have to make sure uh, that uh, a person has a right to contest a charge. I mean, it's just like if you got a tra traffic ticket, mm -hmm. you know, and if you wanted to contest a traffic ticket, what would you do? in order to contest that ticket. You would make sure, you know, that you had the evidence, that you had the proof, that you talked to witnesses, that you did all the things that you need to do. Think about it in a serious case. Think about what you would do if you charged with murder. And think about it what you would do if you couldn't afford a lawyer. You see, lawyers are expensive. A lot of people cannot afford to hire a lawyer. It can cost you, what, $300 an hour to hire a private lawyer to represent you in a case. And so in this economy, the Public Defender's Office plays an even more important and critical role in ensuring that everybody has their uh, their day in court. And so we have highly trained attorneys here. Uh, we have uh, social workers that assist the clients. We have paralegals. We have a great staff of investigators that goes out there and, and pounds the pavement. And your office, I think, was one of like four selected for a special mental health program where you found that there was a 39% revisit, revisit, revisit well, recidivism. Re re recidivism, right. thank you. Right. Uh, r r rate. Yeah, we've uh, been very rather. successful um, in providing uh, programs for kids and also adults uh, who need assistance, especially when they're coming out of jail and prison. We have so many people in jail and prison in this country. You know, part of it is the war on drugs, and, you know, we spend so much resources on incarcerating people that unless we find a way to turn that around, and by turning it around, I mean making sure that when people get out, because most people are going to get out of jail or prison one day, the question is who are they going to be when they come back? And so we believe in investing in employment and education opportunities, helping people turn their lives around, and I've seen it. I had one client who was sent away to prison and came back on a technicality, and the judge decided to give him a chance. And you know what? I saw him the other day. He's working full-time as an electrician. He's taking care of his family. He was able to turn his life around uh, from a life of drugs and committing crimes uh, to being a, uh, a tax-paying citizen. So you never know when people are going to turn the corner. And we have to make sure uh, that uh, when people want to make a change in their life, uh, we're there for them. I have to ask, is Mayor Adachi in your future? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very happy being the, the, the public defender of this great city. Uh, it's truly an I was honor. told to ask you that question by four different people, oh, by the way, oh. who don't know each other. Yeah, well, who, who are you voting for premier? <laughs> <laughs> but, you You're know, highly regarded, so. You but, know. you know, the thing I love most uh, about this job is, you know, being able to fight for justice uh, each and every day. You know, my, my parents and grandparents were interned during the war with 110,000 other mm -hmm. Japanese right. Americans. And one thing that always stayed with In me In Arkansas, is, right? 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you got a good good memory. <laughs> Thank you. And and uh, you know they were in uh, internment camps for four years, and they never had a trial, and they never had an opportunity to plead their case. And it's one of the reasons I became a public defender. I have the opportunity to help give other uh, folks a, a voice, and and I have a great staff to support. You them. know, I have to ask this question, but considering the history of internment. Is that the reason why it seems that only now Asians are really becoming participants in the government system in all levels? Was that the, was it the was the delay a a mistrust in government? No, I, or is that a fair question? I, yeah, I mean, you know, for the Japanese Americans, mm -hmm. you know, who were interned, I think yeah, it definitely had an impact in in terms of their belief in in being able to participate in in government. Um, I do think the fact that we're seeing, you know, more Asian Americans and other uh, ethnic groups involved in government uh, is 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 wonderful. Yeah. Uh, that if you talk about representative government, uh, does it work? Yeah, most of the time it does work. Um, the great thing about our system uh, is that we ultimately don't trust our institutions. Right. Right. If it's done the right. right way, and I'm not saying it always is. Case about, in point with a surveillance issue. Well, it's yeah. about the people, it's or the jury system. Mm -hmm. right? When we talk about the power to convict somebody or acquit somebody, we give that power not to a judge, not to a police officer, not to a prosecutor, but to a jury. And that's one of the greatest things about our, our justice system. What is it that you want people to think of when they say Jeff Adachi? Hmm. Uh, well, nothing bad. I'm <laughs> no, just kidding. You know, I mean, people will think what they think. Mm -hmm. You know, I've taken on some controversial issues. I, last last uh, November, I, I put a pension reform measure. Mm -hmm. I'm a city employee, mm -hmm. right? And I don't pay a penny into my pension uh, right now, even though I get a guaranteed pension. I think even, you have a debate coming up about yeah. that, don't you? <laughs> Even though the, the, the city is facing a, a near $400 million deficit, and these pension costs are going through a roof, mm -hmm. I really felt uh, that that was something that was important uh, to act on. And I knew it wasn't going to be popular. I knew that uh, you know, a lot of uh, folks wouldn't be happy about that, particularly other, uh, my fellow city employees. But I, I felt that it was something that could be done. And I, I guess as public defender, you often have to take unpopular positions. Sometimes you're representing somebody uh, who, you know, is an outcast or seen as an outcast, mm -hmm. but you still have to make sure that you go in there and, and make the points that, that, that need to be made. And that's what I want people to think of at the end of the day, that it's about doing the right thing, about um, taking positions that you believe in uh, that aren't necessarily uh, proper, and uh, making sure that everybody gets their piece of justice at the end of the day. And on that question, too, uh, Oakland has a gang injunction program that you know about. What are your thoughts about the gang injunction program and um, how the cities have been implementing it? Yeah. You know, gang injunctions, to me, um, are simply a tool. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how has that tool been used? And the idea of taking a group of people and saying this group of people shouldn't be allowed to do certain things um, can be used in an oppressive way. And from what I've seen, the gang injunctions in San Francisco um, have you know, had mixed results. In some cases, it displaces crime. In other words, it moves the crime outside of the gang injunction area. In other cases, it labels people unfairly. I represented a person who was charged in a gang injunction in San Francisco, mm. and his only uh, offense was that he rapped about gangs. I mean, that know, was it. That was it. And we had to go to court. Uh, we had to expend resources in order to get him off the gang injunction, which we ultimately did. But it shows that there's a danger in the gang injunction. Is there some utility? Wait, wait, wait. Let me understand. I'll help my pea brain understand something. His offense was that he was rapping. Rapping is free speech. Right. He was rapping about a gang. Were they angry that his and, record didn't make money or something? And, I mean, and, what? And, 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 and the police said that he was admitting, you know, gang membership. 
and, huh. and, and this, this young man had no prior convictions, and so we went to court. But right. it, it shows that sometimes when you cast a wide net, particularly right. if it's simply the police who are identifying who the so-called gang members are, and mistakes can be made, and, and that concerns me. Um, the other thing that concerns me about gang injunctions is that you have to put it together with services. I work with groups like the United Players, uh, which is a, a group that provides um, uh, support to people leaving gangs. And what you really want to do is not only discourage people from leaving gangs, I mean from, from being in mm -hmm, a gang, mm -hmm. but you want to give them incentives not to continue in that lifestyle. How do you do that? Most people who are involved with gangs, gangs are there, to be honest with you, just because they want to belong. Just in the same way that you might want to join the Olympic Club, mm -hmm. or you might want to join the volleyball team. Right. And, um, and, and in, in order to ensure that the next generation of kids don't join gangs, we have to give them incentives not to. Every child has a passion, right? Every parent right. hopes to find that passion in their child. Now, if that passion becomes being a gangster or you know, slinging dope, if that becomes the lifestyle that you aspire, aspire towards and that you're exposed to, yes, you will probably go in that direction. On the other hand, if you have positive experiences, and this is something that I've seen um, again and again, and expose young people to greater opportunities. You know, we're going to be starting a program in the Western Edition. We have two community programs called the Magic Programs, Mo Magic and Be Magic. And these are both programs that work with community-based organizations to improve outcomes for youth, and we do um, entrepreneurial uh, programs, and these are really community programs that we simply provide support to through the public defenders. You office. take volunteers if people want yeah. to help out. Oh yeah, it's hmm. you know uh, these organizations are are primarily all volunteer, and by working with kids, by providing opportunities, exposing uh, them uh, to the the kind of experiences that you know that you grew up with, you will mm -hmm. change lives. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if we're not successful in providing hope for the next generation, uh, we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, people involved in the criminal but justice But do we system. glorify gang activity, in a sense? I mean, in, you mentioned Training Day. Some, you know, Denzel Washington won an Oscar for his behavior. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Well, yeah. You know? I mean, for most people, you know, who have something other than being in a gang or criminal activity uh, to occupy their time. You know, uh, a former burglar once told me, you know what, it's really no fun to creep around in somebody's house, you know, <laughs> stealing things. <laughs> it's really not that fun. And, you know, I, I kind of looked at him and, and uh, you know, he later turned his, his life around, but just that realization for him is, is, is what it took, that there was another way. and. It was only when he was able to find a vocation uh, that he was passionate about that he, he reconnected with his family. So the moral of the story, I think, is that if we want to improve the outcomes for people, we've got to improve their opportunities. Jeff, I know you're a busy man, and uh, we'll be coming back to visit with you again. Yeah, well, you know, please uh, keep up uh, with our office. We have a Facebook page, San Francisco Public Defender's Office, we're at our website www.sfpublicdefender.org And your YouTube page, right? Yeah, and we have a YouTube page. That's where the well. videos are posted. Yeah, we don't have 700 pages like <laughs> that. Well, 1,300. But anyway. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, we're, we're catching up. You are. That's pretty good, though. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Okay, cool.